This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geeks, show number 259, recorded on May 5th, which is, by the way, happy Cinco de Mayo 2016. Echo, play tequila. Tequila original by the chance from Prime Music. Here on Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all your favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from TheAverageGuy.tv here in Bellevue, Nebraska, although it may seem like it's in Mexico. Of course, we post the show with World Class Show Notes each week out at TheAverageGuy.tv. Of course, you can also join us live on the new mobile app, and uh, you can get that super easy if you haven't checked that out yet in a great way to download or to listen to. On the Android, you can download it. On the iPhone, they still don't let you do that yet. But you can subscribe and listen live. It's really the best way to do it. The buttons are available for you uh, out at uh, homegadgetgeeks.com. So we've used that site to kind of house those buttons for you. So if you want to download it for Android, iPhone, it is available there. We will thank LastPass for their sponsorship of that, and they continue to sponsor it, and we thank them for all that they do as well as Spreaker, who, of course, uh, put that together for us. And you can find it again, homegadgetgeeks.com. Find, uh, of course, uh, Home Gadget Geeks is a part of the Geeks Network. You can find this show and uh, many other great podcasts, minus one open mic night, which we've put to bed for a while anyways. But speaking of open mic night, he is here. I, I didn't say thegeeksnetwork.com. Mike Weger is here. Mike, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. That song makes me think of the Sandlot movie when they're at the carnival riding the thing around and around. It just brings back some great memories of my childhood. Yeah, well, it's Cinco de Mayo, you know. You got to yeah. celebrate a little bit. So, oh yeah, you know, it didn't Damn, seem like. That... Sorry, Go ahead, no, you, you've got a future lawyer on the show. You want to play that clip a little longer and get some trouble there? Or... Well, yeah. you know, I, I don't care tonight. It's like, <laughs> hey, if we, if we don't, uh, if if it gets kicked, the worst it could do is get booted off of. Um, Monetization, YouTube. right? Yeah. And and the monetization on YouTube, yeah. yeah. It not still like stays I, up there, I think. Not like I make any money off that anyway. So, <laughs> well, uh, that voice you heard was Paul Byrne. Paul, welcome back. Thank you, Jim. It is great to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. I think the last time I was trying to think back when we had you last, um, and I know it was in Germany. I think we've had you in between those. Yeah, about a year in, ago. In those two, yeah, we we try to get you on once a year to kind of catch up on what's going on in your world and virtualization, what's going on at Tinker Try, and all those things that uh, is keeping uh, you busy. And uh, so it's good to have you back. Welcome back. Yeah, no, thank you. It was April 25th, 2015. Wow. Two, you know, time goes a... time goes by super fast when you when you when in the terms of podcasting when we do this every week. And you, I, one of those things that we, we've had, you know, we've been doing this six years now and we have these repetitive guests on and I try and I always say, I try and get everybody on about once a year and that's the way it works out. But a year's a long time when you think about it. And so thanks for coming back again, Paul, what's been, um, I, I know that, uh, you had a little, you had a little bit of, a little bit of surgery done, everything turning out okay with you. Is that a successful endeavor? Yeah. Uh, just rotator cuff, but repair where they didn't have to staple or, or do much. So just arthroscopic little holes, no big deal. And the tech behind that is you carry a fridge with you for a week and you're good to go. That's it. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Just carry around a fridge. It's really for ice, right? They're keeping a cold pack on your shoulder most of the time. Exactly, so it doesn't swell up. So, um, yeah, if you get tendons, ligaments stapled, as Mike knows, uh, yeah, more serious and more recovery. For me, it was just a little... Uh, Shave us some scar tissue and smoothing out a bone, and you're good to go. Oh. The bone takes a couple months to heal, but I'm fine. I feel great. I'm in better shape now than I have been in a while. Good, good. No, and I'm all set. That's good, and that's you know, it's a little bit of maintenance surgery kind of deal, right? They're doing some preventive stuff just so that as you get older, it's not really bad. I would assume is kind of well, the I way did you're some injury, approaching some Bone that. grows. Oh. Got to file that bone off, so I'm fine. Oh. <laughs> oh, and then uh, Weger, how's uh, let, while we're talking about surgery and injuries, <laughs> yeah, how's your leg? It's doing good. We are one month out from hopefully getting that bolt out. Uh, but until then, we are done with PT. We're walking. We're I can play golf again, which is great. So can kick off the summer with some golf, finally. So it, it's going really well. Back good. out of the boot. Well, yeah. we're going to change this show to this week in medical you know, procedures. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? 
No, there's a lot of good tech. I think, you know, it's interesting. I think the more and more we approach it, I'm sure both uh, Paul for you and Mike for you, you, you both had surgery. Tech in surgery now is so crazy, the things they do. And depending upon when the hospital was built and when the rooms were put together, you might have like more. I mean, I've been in, let me give you an example. So my dentist just put in a new, um, a brand new office. And I sat down in the chair and it started massaging my back, which was awesome to begin oh, with, right? The dentist. And then he had monitors up on the ceiling that could that would ret- that could come down and retract and and there was like a control there in the chair and I could kind of put whatever I want on the screen. I mean, it was like and I expected to get like a, a you know a PlayStation or an Xbox controller at some point that came oh, around. Oh, there you right? go. You know, so it just seems like Paul. Was there any interesting when you were having your when you were in for the procedure? Any interesting tech besides the the healing stuff? Was there any interesting tech that you were surprised by? Yeah, so they can give you a light whiff of anesthesia if they uh, numb your arm, and they so they completely paralyzed my arm for like 30 hours. So it's spooky, but you know they use um, live imaging camera, I guess you know X-ray as they're going in to uh, do a nerve block, live. and they're really good at it. That arm is dead. Nothing. I mean, uh, so when I got out of there, get home, I got the sling. My arm would follow the sling. I'd be completely unaware of it until I noticed something slapping my legs. Like, what the heck is that? Oh, it's my own arm. So, so anyhow, they've they've mastered that stuff, and that reduces yeah. pain. That first day, there was no painkiller because you're not feeling anything. But even day two, I, I really didn't need much. No big deal. Oh, that's good. I, I told you, we were talking about it, and I told you, stay ahead of the pain meds. I think I told you, too. Yeah, you told Mike. me that, too. Yeah. Well, and that's, like, post-op is all the cool stuff that, I, like, we're on the cusp of having uh, with, the, like, the Apple Watch and all our fitness bands where they can track how you're moving. Like, it would be perfect for my situation where after I break my ankle, it can gauge my, how I'm walking and everything, and that could be reported back to the doctor, and they could send me back updated stretches and stuff to do to help me if I'm limping or doing certain stuff. And we're so close to having that, they just announced it, uh, but it's, it's it's not out yet, and of course, my doctor hasn't used it, but it'd be still really cool. Yeah. Paul, any tech in the PT that you're taking? Both of you have had to do some kind of PT. Any interesting tech in the physical therapy that you've had to go through? None whatsoever. You take okay. a bar, and you stretch, and you put yourself in agonizing pain. That, that's the daily routine. It's it's awesome. Yeah. Just break, just break that scar <laughs> tissue, right, or whatever yeah, they're trying to do. Yeah, just push through it. And so, yeah, yeah it, it, very low tech. Old okay. school in that. But, yeah. Yeah. Mike, any, any high tech in your, in your PT? They had some really high tech stuff. They have this wall that surrounds you, and you have pegs that you have to get into certain poles, but I didn't get to use it. But it's meant for people who are like applying for disability and they have to judge how far they can move their range of motion, how strong they are and all that sort of stuff. So I didn't get to do it, but I saw it being used, which was kind of cool. But no, yeah, same, same with him, big rubber bands and uh, some, some balls to sit on and walk on and stuff like yeah. that. So yeah. that's about it. Well, I've continued. We in pre-show we're talking about. I've I've uh, I've had a very sedimentary. I think that's the right word. Last uh, year or so, is I've had trouble running, and um, I, this time last year I just finished a half marathon and I really injured myself pretty well and spent most of the summer trying to heal it and I couldn't get it healed and so without running I couldn't do much and so I put on a bunch of weight and so I'm trying to get back into it. Man, the the band two that I've you know I bought the band two back during MVP and I didn't use it a lot for a while. I started using that more, and this goal of 10,000 steps or some activity every single day has made a huge difference. And and so you know I've got a I've got a long road back to get to it. But using that tech to keep me accountable, watching those stats, uh, even the sleep monitoring, like I need to get more sleep, and I you know those kinds of things have been really really good as I've been watching the stats. So that's helped me. Paul, did you want to show something there on the screen? Yeah, I do. I'm trying to find the name. It's PT Timer on iOS. I think there's Android. And, um, yeah, it just keeps me on track. So when you're doing PT for you know, 40, 50 minutes, you got all these timing things. There's my shoulder torture routine, right, Ooh. that I'm late on today, so it gives me an exclamation that I have not been good tonight. Um, so after the podcast, I'll be torturing my shoulder. Nice. <laughs> but so anyhow, those are really helps. you to do at home every day. Is that what they've, the PT, Correct. is that what the app does? Core strengthening, lifting weights, whatever, it talks you through it. So, you know, five seconds hold, release, and you just, talk, you just listen to a podcast or whatever while that oh thing is going in the background, giving you a little chime or indicator cool. when you've done it enough, yeah. which I like, so I don't have to think or look at a stopwatch. I can just do other stuff while I'm exercising. Yeah, that's a great idea of, of having like the whole your whole PT session like scripted out, so to speak, where we just play it in a playlist and it would be someone telling, because that's what it is, right? It's it's yeah, telling you what yeah. to do? Yep. That, yeah. So I'm just looking for the app on the Play Store. Yeah, uh, sorry, in the uh, 
Apple Store. But um, yep, PT space tracker if you're looking for something. But yeah, any kind of physical therapy or even just exercise routines, and uh, it lets you share your routine with others and so forth. But PT timer, excuse me, that's the name. PT cool. space timer. Well, there's there's our tech angle on it. I was searching for a tech angle somewhere. You got it. I just <laughs> really tried to get in there. We we did find it. That's uh that's good to hear. Paul, uh, let's catch up with you a little bit. Tinkertry.com uh, is where you kind of land, and a lot of great articles out there. You continue to do a lot of great stuff. We had, um, you had just recently picked up a Ring doorbell, and we had talked with Jamie uh, Siminoff over at Ring, oh, a couple months ago now, and uh, I think early in the month here, or how long have you had your, your doorbell? And let's give us a little rundown. You've got a post on it out at Tinkertry.com, but give us a little uh, rundown on the Ring. Sure. Yeah, I could read the post, but it would take two hours. <laughs> it's a long one. No, summarize um, it for us. The story unfolded last Friday when uh, the doorbell rung and my doorbell had arrived. My Ring Video Doorbell Pro is what we're talking about, the new one. Now, that was a pre-order, so it sat on pre-order for about six weeks and then, you know, finally arrived. So I, was, uh, I ordered the very first day the pre-orders started happening, so I was among the very first to receive it through mail. Uh, there's a twist to that story, though. And it's relevant. Um, Best Buy jumped the gun. <laughs> Started selling a week early. Well, that means firmware wasn't ready. And I can imagine Jamie's life was a little difficult. Um, they kind of botched a launch. It was pretty serious. Um, I figured this out afterward when I realized, oh, I'm not first in the world with this doorbell. There's a whole bunch of Best Buy people talking about it. No one on Amazon, no one who got it from Ring.com directly. So it's kind of an interesting twist, knowing, okay, early adopter, this is going to be a little bit rough. And... Still, good timing. It arrived on a Friday. was able to install it on Saturday, do a little unboxing video, and try it out. And it's been pretty good, but I've had some rough spots. And uh, they come down to code, it looks like, you know, firmware. So I'll probably get through those. I, I can get into the detail a little bit. But the gist is we're talking about a much smaller doorbell. And the first thing I was thinking about is, oh, wasn't I just listening to Dave McCabe and talking about the width of his door sill, right? Yeah, he was. Well, you're trying to meet that market, and it's a whole lot narrower. So I actually tried talking to Dave directly in the post and gave him the dimensions. Uh, it is much uh, narrower and much smaller than the old one. Um, that's kind of a big deal for a lot of people with maybe brick facade houses, right, or, or just very nor narrow door cells. So um, I think a much bigger audience because that, but it went up 50 bucks instead of 200. It's now 250. And the old one had gone down to 179 at Costco, bundled with an extra chime, which is usually an extra. I think it's 30 dollars. So you know the prices had dipped, but then of course that was kind of the signal that a new one was coming out. I really didn't expect a new one to come out so soon, um, but it did, and that actually enabled me to return my original video ring video doorbell uh, back to Costco because I was well within really? the 30 days. It was within the it was within that time frame, huh? Correct. Cool. Yeah. So that's cool. kind of the. Gist What's the of difference story? in width between the Pro and the 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 first gen one? Yeah, and you see my eyeballs darting as I'm going through my article. Here we go. The difference in width is. 2.43 inches in width on the old one, 1.83 on the new one. Wow. And uh, if Tinkertry.com, right on the main page, you can see pictures of the two drawn to scale next to each other, so quite a bit smaller. Um, this sounds a little silly and nitpicky, but the doorbell itself, the old one's very metallic and has a premium feel, the, the very minimal clearances and wiggle as you push the doorknob. It just feels kind of pricey, or on higher end anyway. The new one's a little cheaper. They went with a, a just a black plastic knob that sticks out a bit, but that's more like a traditional doorbell, easy to reach and by feel and touch and make sure you pushed it in. So I think it's maybe a better design, it just feels a little cheaper though, a little more like ready for mass production. And uh, that's a little bit of a surprise when you spend more on the product, right? Any any change in the camera? Yeah, they went from 720 to 1080, although I don't really see that and people are reporting the same thing, that you don't really see a difference in the quality. I think the playback of the cloud recording, that comes out better. So that sounds familiar, Jim, right? Mm -hmm. They're streaming to the cloud better than what you see live in your iOS or Android device. Yeah. Which is okay, you know, because if you're trying to play back something interesting that happened, as long as you're a way to get to a clearer copy than what you saw live when you answered your door, that's okay. Um, but good point. Um, One of the, I've seen Jamie advertising, you know, he's on late night cable now, and I've seen him. Oh, really? He's doing the commercials, yeah. Oh wow! And uh, there, there, yeah, it was, yeah, you know, we had just had him on the show, and then maybe two weeks later, I saw him on TV, and I'm like, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> he was just on our program. 
Yeah, it was a really uh, cool which interview, was, which is pretty, pretty cool. Oh, it was tons of fun. I mean, we, we just love that stuff. You mentioned, you know, he kind of foreshadowed this a little bit, if I remember the interview of talking about, you know, we got some new stuff coming. They wouldn't, there are certain things they don't want to talk about, and that was a couple months back um, mm-hmm. all, along that. But one of the things they did announce, Paul, was, you know, the little stick-ups. They've got some, some cameras you can kind of stick up in various locations. Did you look at that at all in, in this, and did, did you get any, or are you sticking with the doorbell for now? Yeah, no, I'm shopping very carefully, and I, I return things that don't work out. That's kind of what my blog's all about. I'm watching every penny, but um, a couple of more things that made sense. Yeah, it's 250 It's more money, but um, here's the thing. It's designed without a battery, so it's not meant to charge. Um, slimmer on your house, and it's one skew, meaning you order this one part, and you get four faceplates, black, dark gray, uh, silver, and white. So, you know, some of that stuff just makes sense. He packaged up a single part number that you order and get from various various places, and now you can just pick your color. So I like, you know, I like a, a lot of little steps forward as I was covering some of the differences. Which is maybe why it feels a little cheaper because you got to ship four faceplates, and so right, don't you think? Yeah, it's more it's... the button itself though. The button okay. itself wiggles a little as you push it. Sorry, it's uh, it's very minor, but yeah. you know, even half a millimeter, you kind of feel, and it's one of those perceptual things. Not a showstopper, deal breaker at all. I care more about stable firmware. So um, I let me. F- I think I finished the positives. Yeah, specs, you know, better specs and so forth. There are some drawbacks. You want to touch on those next? Yeah, go ahead. Surprise. The surprise was, well, getting the box. Um, the documentation on the website, I hadn't really I had seen some videos and knew there was this Ring Pro power kit. I'm thinking, oh, there's a little electronic module maybe. Uh, when I unboxed it, though, you hear my surprise that I didn't actually know about it when I first unboxed it. I just, you know, doorbell rang, got out the camera, recorded my unboxing, hadn't read much about uh, the install of the Pro. Why is that a surprise? Well, that gets installed over by your door chime, a mechanical door chime that has, you know, plungers that make a nice tone when someone rings the bell. That is not how the original ring worked at all. It, you were talking about diodes out near the doorknob, uh, sorry, the doorbell button. So that was just, oh, a little curveball, like, okay, I guess I'm getting a little step ladder out and working up high in my in my foyer area near the door. Wasn't a big deal, didn't take that long, but just a surprise. And then naturally people are like, do you need it? Why do you need it? What to do? Supposedly it's an amplifier to make sure no matter what voltage you have, and there's a huge range. I think it's, uh, i got to get the number right, um, 16, okay. a comparison table here buried in there. The new one has a smaller range of transformers it works with, so this little device helps counteract that. It makes sure that the night vision IR blasters that flood your front lawn or front door area um, can run despite whatever weird transformer you might have, old or new. So that was the gist of it. Truth is, though, it actually works without it. I tried it. And actually, tech support had me trying without it at some point. So that was one surprise. That only adds like five, ten minutes to install. Not a big deal. Um, the other drawback was, though, and here's the, the weird one, their initial firmware that was out that Saturday was, I think it ended at .29, and then they moved to .40. Yes, 1.0.29. Had some trouble where it could get in a wonky state and kind of need to be rebooted. Let's think about that. How do you reboot a doorbell? You've got to go to your circuit breaker panel, cut power to that transformer for 20 seconds, and restore it, which can kind of affect maybe wife acceptance factor and other things. <laughs> here, here's the worst part. When it was dead one morning after memory leak or whatever else killed that firmware 1.0.29, you'd push the doorbell. Okay, your app wouldn't go off. It wouldn't ring. But what's worse is the mechanical doorbell didn't ring. Now, that had me worried, and people started adding comments on my site like, same thing here, Paul. That's a little scary. Now, they came out with a new firmware already. By Sunday, they got that push to me. Had problems one time pushing. The, the website said I was on 4.0. Went back the next morning and said I'm on 2.9 again. I'm like, oh, guess I'm having a little trouble pushing it out. Talk to support. They're wonderful. They answer the phone right away. And it's been stable for three days since. So I might be nearing the end of my own story. There's more twists and turns to the story if you read the article. But that's the gist of it. I want to reserve judgment until I've owned it longer. I don't want someone to hold off or think they're never going to buy it based on something because I'm just one data point in one house that has an 18-volt reading on my 16-volt transformer. You may have something completely different in your home. Um, the old one handled 8 to 24 volts. The new one handles 16 to 24 volts, a smaller range. So, yeah, a lot of little details that emerged that I had not read in any FAQ anywhere, and that's why you know, I just started typing them on my site as I was talking to support to help other people be a little more informed. I think by next weekend or a month from now, those people will probably be fine. 
But if you got it in that very first wave of those first few days, yeah, it was a little bit of a rough weekend. Yeah, he said when we had Jamie on, he said, you know, pushing out firmware was one of the hardest things that they have to do when they put these in, you know, right? You got to put them in. It's like a living, this is like a living thing. And uh, probably didn't help you got them early, you know, from that oh, standpoint. Yeah. And they weren't they weren't quite ready for it. If you, um, I'll, I'll put this in the show notes uh, as well, but uh, you want to go out, if you've been thinking about, um, you know, this getting one of these, Paul goes through it. And I imagine... If you got a wider door, a uh, wider door at this point, and you want to, you can get a great deal on on the original version right now. Like you said, what one seventy nine, and you get an extra chime with it. Is that what you said? You do at Costco. They still have them in stock. Um, my article does talk about some drawbacks though, and why I ended up returning. It wasn't just because the new one had come out, but I could not get motion detection working. Hmm. It used heat. Um, well, it wasn't very uh, high resolution heat zones. And they just didn't work out in my situation. Whereas the new one uses, you know, pixel changes. The image changes in the areas that you define by dragging your thumbs around works wonderfully. Um, until the latest firmware where they're having motion detection problems that are supposed to get resolved any day now. So the, the app looks good. The promise is there. I'm still excited that in a week or two I'll probably be just like, you know, thumbs up, go order this. Yeah. Um, at the moment it's not even on Amazon, so I don't make a penny on any of this. <laughs> There's no commissions. It's right. just me writing a technical article for people to be an informed buyer. If people think you get rich writing an article like this, you do not. Uh, Best Buy affiliate fees are 1%. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. come on. You'd have to sell it off a lot. It's is that, were, were they exclusive to Best Buy? Yeah. It seems to, so, you know, if, you know how affiliate stuff works, like Skim Links or Amazon uh, Associates program. Well, Best Buy is only 1%. Right. Um, and Amazon it's not even there for pre-order or order or any of that. I don't know why. Mike uh, Howard right now in the Facebook group uh, has posted. So if you go to theaverageguy.tv slash Facebook, you can uh, – he, he bought the solar panel that comes for the, you know, the stick cam that you can put anywhere, and then you can put the solar panel up for that, and he is showing oh, cool. that off um, as well. So um, I, so you think – so in a time-shifted manner, most of the listeners here at this point are probably going to listen to this a week from now, right? It'll be next week uh, for for us at this point. You're thinking, Paul, next week or two, most of those kinks should be worked out. And you said they've been very responsive from a tech support standpoint, right? Correct. And actually, uh, just before the podcast, I just got an email from like a level two engineer saying, wow, uh, Paul, I, I heard playback of your tech support call. They disclose that they're recording your calls, right? And he's like, oh, you got a multimeter and you've got some information that we might be able to help with. And can you, you know, give me a readout on this, that, and I'm like, okay, so that's that's right up my alley, right? Helping mm -hmm. them shine and get over these little bumps, I, I strongly suspect it'll be fine. If you care about motion detection, the current firmware, it's not working correctly right now, but if you only want it as a doorbell where you can answer or live view works, supposedly on the old doorbells I'm hearing, although Richard Gunther's had some trouble there, and the new ones for sure. If you just want an ability on maybe a second home to just get live video on demand with your iOS device or Android, yeah, you can go for it now. But if you're trying to do motion detection, that part's the part that's the last piece that looks a little dicey at the moment. Hopefully, it'll be fixed in a matter of days, not weeks. Yeah, so. you hope. Uh, anything else? you got a long article, man. I posted that in the show notes as well, so folks want to take a look. Uh, you, one of the things I've always appreciated about Tinkertry.com is just the detail, the depth that you go into on your post. Most, most of us write like six words and then put it out. And you really, uh, Paul, you really dive in with pictures and diagrams and charts. And so it's really worth taking a look at. Anything else in there that you would highlight uh, in the experience with the doorbell? No, I want to end on a happy note. So some uh, visitors were over the house today while I was actually out. And there I am at a restaurant, and my phone makes a little chime that someone's rung the doorbell. And it's my happy nephew jumping up and down for the camera, so excited to see a little <laughs> bit of tech in the house. And it was just fun. It brought a smile to my face. And Ring lets you optionally share a URL of that little video with, you know, WhatsApp and your little family private chat. Just a fun little moment. So that's the technical victory, right? Someone had a little fun coming to your house, seeing his giggling face. Yeah, it's cool. And you talked to him through it? Uh, I did not because I knew my wife was home and answering the door and I didn't want to mess up the flow. Right? <laughs> but you <laughs> could have, right? I mean, you oh, could sure. have. Uh, yeah, and it answers quite quickly. It on. And I do have a video on YouTube and embedded in the article where it shows the timing from when you push the button till you hear the chimes. It's quite quick. So that's where this thing really shines. The Pro is technically and performance-wise better and faster than its less expensive predecessor. 
There's kind of no doubt about it when you see how quick the response is. And that's at a front door where typically people don't have amazing Wi-Fi. In my house, it's pretty strong. Um, so yeah, check it out. Nice little video. It's only 10 seconds, and it shows you exactly how long things take when you use this product. Yeah, cool stuff. It's uh, I think you know we we've, we've been talking about moving, and and I've been holding off on installing some of these things just because I don't want to rip them out or leave them. You know, you, these are it's, uh, 250 bucks. You know, that's that's a tough one to leave behind. You know. Yeah, and I'll, I'll and I, I'll also add this. I've had my house. Uh, it was new in '93. We got it in '94. First owners. And I've had wireless chimes for like 15 years. So you can go to Home Depot a long time ago. You, you get a little module you install near the door chime itself, and it wirelessly transmits to AC modules you plug in outlets around your home. So I've been used to not missing the front door. What this gives me is a whole new level, though, and I'm, I'm on the phone constantly for my day job and someone's delivering, or when I'm not home and I don't want a package missed. You know, that's what it gives me. So I had some, you know, conversations with my wife, too. We had use cases. I wasn't just buying it to play. Um, and of course, security for a lot of people, that peace of mind. So um, I'm already excited. I, I really never got any of the Mike Fauché cameras. I had one for like six years ago. But boy, I, a little robo camera, you can move it around. It was only like 120 bucks where you can turn it left and right. But the quality was pretty terrible. This does blow all those away. You know, you can answer video and be talking to someone in like three, four seconds. If you're at home and you're both on the same Wi-Fi, you're answering that front doorbell quite quickly, I think well under four seconds from when the bell rings till you're talking to the person. Is there any latency in the conversation? Uh, minimal. Like if I'm waving my hand to a recording I'm doing while I'm in front of the house, it looks like there's like a half second latency. Mm -hmm. You can actually see that in my demo video um, where I answer the phone live while aiming the camera at the ring bell. So you could see the timing from when I push the button to when I've answered the call and how long the lag is and all that, and the latency. The, the lag being the time to answer, and then the latency would be when I'm swinging my hand back and forth. How much does my hand you know, lag behind visually what you see on the camera? I can't wait to have a house. If I bring any more tech into this tiny little apartment, I think Hannah's going to kill me. But that being said, when I have a house, there's so many things like with Ring and just stuff that needs to go into the new house, like all the new tech. But I'm the it's same as you, Jim. You know, you're in a holding pattern. You kind of want to try. But know, it's, it's also it's not a terrible position to be in because, you know, you give it a few more months to a year and things progress like we just saw this new edition of the Ring uh, is better than the last one, so... Sarah bought some that. some new LED lights, uh, just standard, you know, that just just not no high tech in them, just LED lights, right? And um, I was like, how much were these? And she's like, oh, I, I got a packet of two for like six bucks, <laughs> and or something like that, six eight bucks, so four bucks each. And you're like, oh, okay, that's not terrible. And then I'm like, should should I put these in? They're gonna last forever. And like, you know, do I, you know, that those are the conversations. I mean, that's what I'm. <laughs> thinking in my head right now is do right. I leave these good light bulbs in or do I you know leave the crappy CFLs that we've been or incandescent I don't have too many more incandescent left but that's been one of those thoughts I've had because I've got you know we've got some smart bulbs right. hanging around the house those are definitely not staying oh I mean, yeah are, my apartment complex will be angry because they're going to come into a dark apartment because we almost have them now in every single fixture that's attached to anything in the apartment yeah they're all they're all smart and yeah. so I'm like yeah I'm not leaving those yeah, it's 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 uh, one of those dilemmas that. Um, but did you make a pile of the old ones? That's what I did. So in my cupboard, I made a pile of all the old lights. So I'm just gonna put those all back in at the very end. Idea. No, and even I thought they were all dead. They go, are these all dead? I'm like, no, no, no. We gotta save those. Those have a purpose. Have to put not right now. Good lights or something, Paul. Right. Yeah. Speaking of LEDs, Jim, above my head here, there's six <laughs> LEDs in that fixture. It's a little nuts, but um, 60 watts are much more typical, right? So you can get, um, you know, a three pack of 60 watt LEDs with good color rendering index. I don't look all sickly and weird when I walk in my office. That's important to me and that's down to, I think it was uh, 11 bucks for a three pack at my local Costco as well. So you're right, uh, LEDs yeah. are really coming down in price and it's yeah. wonderful. It I think by the beginning of the year, it'll, that'll just be what you buy. Yep, so this yeah. office room I'm in, you know, heat matters in the smallish office when you got the door closed and you don't want heat gain. Replacing the 40, uh, sorry, the long, fluorescent tubes with the small fixture that looks decent with LEDs, just a big win, and compatible with dimmer, something yeah. I wanted for years, and I struggled with that. Not all dimmers like LEDs much. I finally got that nailed. So you're looking at Insteon with a tiny little controller and me having dimmable LEDs that don't flicker and have a very slight hum if your head's like less than two feet away. So um, yeah, there's, there's tech right around me in the room we're in. 
And that would be uh, LEDs are just a big win. It's one of my little things I blog about once or twice a year. Still looking for the ultimate 100 watt, maybe. And I'm picky about color. I don't yeah. like the cheap ones. They're terrible. Yeah. Well, we did get the cheap. The, so the cheap LED we got are white. I mean, they are bright and white. And I think, you know, we'll probably leave that in there and just leave it what it is. It's plenty bright in the hallway. It's just not, you know, it had, I'd like a little bit less of a bright white in there. However, down here in the, in the room, we, I just installed, you know, we had a big long CFL in there for a while. And I just went down to Home Depot and picked up the, a new LED kit. And it's just, it's a, it's half the size and all the brightness and a really nice color. And I think I paid uh, 40 bucks for the thing. And so there, we're just in that sweet spot where, you know, like I said, I think by this time next year. Hey, Rennie was asking, Paul, how do you update the firmware in that on that phone? How does that work? Oh, sure. Uh, let me just close yeah, out the lights. So, we'll yeah, I updated a, an article uh, about LEDs, but yeah, this is a ceiling fixture, right? Um, and then again, affordable. I think the fixture itself, there we go. Three LED bulbs and a fixture that I got way back in 2012. Um, 88 bucks. That wasn't horrible, and now, of course, the bulb price has come down, so you can do this whole project for a whole lot cheaper now. Okay, and I got so into it, I actually talked to the guy who runs Philips on the right here at CES 2012 nice. and said, hey, you realize Home Depot is like out of stock and people are trying to buy your bulbs? He's like, yeah. And so anyway, I had one of those little moments where you're actually talking to the, you know, the company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah, All right. cool. Back to firmware and yeah. the ring. Um, so, yeah, this device is in the side of your house. They handle it from the cloud. So the ring is connected to your Wi-Fi router. It's got an IP address in your home network, which is a concern. I'd rather be on a separate network someday, Internet of Things, but never mind that. Uh, it is connected to the cloud, meaning their servers and their cloud storage. You're not recording your video to a NAS. Important to point that out. And you pay 3 bucks a month if you want to keep those videos around for six months. So there is a little bit of a monthly fee um, or $30 a year, saving a little bit if you prepay a year. So this is a third of $1,000 to own this for three years. That's significant. 350 bucks to own this, $250 product plus some cloud stuff. That's why I try to <laughs> I try to share with the world, think about it, you know, you're buying something 350 that hopefully you have for way more than three years. Yeah. It's going to cost something. Um, we used to okay. balk at those numbers on security systems, right? When mm -hmm. AC, a, a uh, ACT or who is the who's the security company? ADT. Yeah. ADT. Thank you. And they have tie-ins with if this and that and ADT uh, door knobs, door um, tumblers or switch. Uh, sorry, electronic door knobs. Yeah. They've got tie-ins with them. Um, what do you think? Should I try to share my desktop and show a video? Or is it going to be horribly choppy? Uh, I don't know. Give it a try. Let's, Let's give it a shot. We'll hang out to try here. Let's see if we can bring down Chrome, Jim. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> let me let me focus on you here. We won't be able to hear the sound, Paul, to be honest with you. So okay. I can fake that here. We can yeah. feed that. You just talk about what you're doing. Okay. Did you hear a little bit of sound of that one or no? Yeah, a little bit. A little yeah. bit. We can hear it. Yep. Anyhow, you get the idea. In 10 seconds, I show you uh, the bell ringing and then answering it. So back to the firmware question. On the web portal or on the iOS app, you can check what firmware you're at. Obviously, in the long term, I hope to not be checking that anymore or care. Yeah, right? yeah. It's um, a software. Hey, you said you would rather have that on a separate network. Talk to me a little bit about that. What's You, you breezed past that, but why? Yeah, sure. So I went to a Internet of Things presentation. At, Go ahead uh, and drop your share on the, on the oh, sure. desktop yep. for me. Then we can start that discussion just so we see you. Okay. So yeah, um, about six months ago, I drove up to Boston to a virtualization user group meeting that had an Intel employee there, and he was talking about Internet of Things. It wasn't so much about virtualization, it was more about, you know, gadgets in your home, uh, home automation and so forth. And the first hand that went up at the end for Q&A is, what about security? Um, it doesn't really matter how powerful these devices are. They're a little Linux uh, gizmos. Think about you know, Raspberry Pi or other small devices. Well, these are full operating systems connected to your home. And Ring actually had a bit of a black eye when early days people could rip it off your house, run some uh, scripts against it, and get it like an API uh, and find, oh, that's the person's Wi-Fi key for that home. I just ripped this doorbell off of. They fixed that quickly. You know, Jamie's responsive and he's following this stuff and it's good. But bigger picture, you get more and more devices like this in the coming years. 
do we really want to have to follow the firmware levels and the latest vulnerability? And and then when you get a scary broadcast by, you know, Security Now, Broadcaster, Steve Gibson or whatever, oh, crap, there's one of the ten devices I have all over my house that's vulnerable this week. And that's the part that worries me a little. I'd rather, since I don't need to be pinging these things, they don't need to be on my home's network and a vector for attack for someone to hop into that device and then do whatever they want with the rest of my network, I'd rather they be on a separate net network. But guest network doesn't work so well for that because think about the web portal you log in when you do guest network. It doesn't work for a gadget like this. So I feel like future routers might nail this. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I, don't, I know we're not there yet. Right? I don't think anyone markets a router where you kind of have an Internet of Things subnet, a separate Wi-Fi for your stuff. Would you have like to have a separate radio for that, or are you talking about just a separate submask or oh, perf subnet? Yeah, perfect question. Radios. Okay, so 2.4 gigahertz, original ring doorbell, that's all I could do. Same with the Ecobee 3 that I also have in my house. 2.4 is it. Kind of a bummer when 802.11c and the less crowded 5 gigahertz the way we want to go. So the new ring doorbell, ring video doorbell pro, adds 5 gigahertz capability which may be having trouble right now. I turned up my 2.4 and the front doorbell went offline and didn't come back. I'm like, oh, I guess it doesn't want to negotiate. So another firmware thing maybe. But anyhow, let's, let's imagine they get that working out and your house has good signal to your front door, which is not that likely on 5 gigahertz unless you have a powerful router. But all that aside, a solution to everything I just said, I mean, uh, it, it didn't have to be a separate network, although with bandwidth and maybe video streaming from a doorbell that you might leave recording for 15 minutes at a time, wouldn't be so bad if a separate antenna was just for that Internet of Things stuff. Uh, you know, of course, now you're probably looking at a 30, 40 watt Linux router that's 300 bucks sitting on your desk warming up the room. Yeah. Because <laughs> right now we're at like 11 watts for a, a cheap router. Um, so I don't know. You know the fix is going to be difficult. Um, I think maybe Google's router sounds like the closest. You know, cylindrical router with a really nice app to manage it. I've heard you talking about that lately on podcasts. And it has bandwidth preferences like it can say hey front doorbell I want you to, I want to steer you to 5 gigahertz instead of 2.4 where everything else in this person's house is so I think routers are getting smarter and catching up first step would be bandwidth steering whereas right now it's just okay you pull in your driveway your phone's gonna grab the 2.4 gigahertz because it reaches in your driveway and 5 gigahertz probably doesn't and now you're stuck in that frequency as you walk around the house even if 5 gigahertz would perform better in some of your rooms uh, the Google router sounds like it'll handle that better so I think there's a lot of room for improvement. So security concerns and frequency concerns with video. I'm worried about both of them. And I think routers should really market themselves to, to lick those problems. Mm -hmm. Security, I don't think anyone's noticed yet until there's some major breach, right? Um, like target style or something that you actually hear about. So if somebody you, breaks into the house, yeah, hacking the... Steal something valuable from the executive. And then <laughs> yeah. turning the doorknob open, you know, unlocking the front door because it's, that's enabled. To yeah. do that, Paul. Paul, you mentioned a couple times. You mentioned in there the lack of range on five gigahertz. And on on home server show, ironically, we've been talking a ton about mesh. You know, kind of mesh oriented routers, uh, putting them around. Dave's got a big. You know, he's got a bigger home. Uh, here, I can get away. I've got the on hub, and seemingly with everything I'm doing, I can get away with serving most of the house with the on hub. Not everybody's in that. Have you looked at the mesh style uh, when we think of the the various, you know, there's three or four that are out there right now. Have you looked at that at all? Is, is that a solution to get better Wi-Fi to the front door? I would defer to Mike Fauché and and Dave McCabe. They've been talking about this and yeah. playing with it a whole lot it's more. It's a home but, server show, by the way. For my yeah. listeners, if you don't listen to home server show, it would, it's not really intuitive, but yeah. we've been talking about a lot of home automation on home server show recently, and so homeservershow.com. But I'll go out on a limb and say a couple things. One, uh, an in-laws house, real trouble in one room. I got a repeater that just takes the Wi-Fi signal and you put it halfway between the router and the person that's trying to get signal, and it worked beautifully. That was a Linksys device. Uh, no, uh, yeah. Another one was TP-Link that was highly rated for wired. I tried both those devices in my home. Neither worked well for me. Heck with it, I just really want one router, which is almost enough. And the reviews I've been reading about the OnHub that are quite a bit newer than my Linksys EA 6900 from two and a half, three years ago, they look pretty good, so I'm kind of waiting for the next generation on Hub. I feel like that might be the one for me to keep my eye on. I'm a little too early, to, and it'll work fine. I put it at the edge of my office desk. It's pretty centrally located. My house is small enough. It'll make it everywhere it needs to. So I don't really want the complexity of another $90 gizmo to troubleshoot when some gadget complains in the house that it's not working. I like the concept of the Unhub, 
one device and one app that'll tell me which device is in trouble or do I need to reboot the whole router. So you guys talking about it has been great. And that's yeah. how I kind of slowly shop, right? I kind of I often wait for the second generation. And um it sounds like that's where I might be headed for the on up. Hopefully well, it succeeds. They've had their troubles with their products. But. I typically would not be on the edge for a wireless router, you know. I I I'm kind of that way too. I kind of yeah. wait for second gen and come behind and let everybody else take the, you know, take it on the chin. I just happen to be in need of a wireless router and and you know, at $185 off Amazon, they're pretty expensive and there's a lot of future proofing that has gone into that. I mean, they really have tried to think. I have the somebody asked me a couple shows ago. Is it the ASUS or the or the uh, the TP-Link? And I have the TP-Link version of it. Seemingly, as I've read on all those things, there's a lot of features not even turned on yet. You know, and in, in there that where it's using it, the capability is there. So I'm kind of hoping here in the future some of those things became available. But that being said. I've had great luck with it so far. I've been super stable. One of my favorite things is going to the app, and it does a speed check every other day. And so I can kind of get a list of the speed check that it took and, and you know, just on the phone. And I can do it from anywhere. I can reboot my router now from anywhere. So if Sarah calls me and it's like, hey, it's not working, I can jump into the app and reboot it. And that's pretty cool. So I've I've been nothing but happy on the, the OnHub router. So, yeah, I'm showing my desktop, Jim, just to... Just briefly recap. So it was October 2013 when they moved to Doxis 3 cable modems in my neighborhood, and I got up to a, a whopping 180 down and 30 up, which is awesome. I mean, that was quadrupling my speed overnight. But actually, my router was outpowered, so it was time to shop for a new router at that time. And that's where I took these three. Asus um, RTAC68U was the darling then, Netgear R7000. And only one of them didn't reboot every time I made a change. Most the other two brands, they'd reboot for 40, 50 seconds, taking out the whole home when all I was doing was changing port forwarding or some of them even just adding a DHP reservation. So I just returned them. All three performed well enough for my whole home that the signal wasn't my primary driver. It was more about stability, staying up for months without rebooting. That would be successful, especially with kids streaming or gaming or whatever where they'd really be pretty upset if, you know, took out the Internet in the middle of it <laughs> by accident. So I consider a router successful. It doesn't need to be rebooted more than once every other month or something. Anything less, I get pretty annoyed. Yeah, um, I haven't. Re I have not rebooted the OnHub since we got it. I mean, I set oh. it up, did a couple. You know, you did the setups and and some other things with it. It's sitting right in front of me, and um, you know, it's down here, middle of the house, on in the basement. I'm assuming it's serving the whole house. We've. I haven't had any complaints from my daughter. I haven't had any complaints from my wife. Everything's up and running all the time. There's, she's not walking down here and rebooting the, the, the you know, the router, and so, uh, and so far, and like I said, there's a lot of, a, a lot of cool features that, uh, that come with it. So, so far, so good. And I'm, I'm hoping, you know, there's a bunch of future stuff that's coming with wireless, and there's still a lot of things to be worked out as far as what we're going to use and what we're not going to use. So, it'll be a bit, be interesting to see. Well, Paul, thanks. That's a great rundown on the ring, and as well as we, you know, dig in a little bit into the wireless. That's a, a key component. It's interesting. I hadn't really thought about using a separate wireless network for, you know, for the for my you know Internet of Things devices, and you could kind of segregate. I mean, with a, I've got this. Well, it doesn't. Well, I could get a cheap wireless router and make it an endpoint and put it out by the front door, right, and wire to it. If you wanted to do it that way, and then separate that off, right? That's you could do something like that. Sure, I guess you, yeah. So that that's a good point. Um, maybe I should flip that around. Let's say your legacy devices, like my Ecobee three now is, and I complained in my review of that, saying it feels a little like built-in obsolescence to not bother to put a five gigahertz radio in there, right? But anyhow, your smartphones certainly have 802.11 AC at this point and perform really well on five gigahertz if you do a speed test two or three times quicker than anything you probably ever saw before. So. Your path forward would be, you know, your Surface Book, your Surface uh, Pro 4, all that new stuff in phones. Maybe that ends up being your 5 gigahertz world with a non-hub or something that has decent signal strength, not the first generation from three years ago. And your legacy network becomes, I don't know, your old Nintendo uh, yeah, right Wii there. and your old, it could be 3 and your yeah. front doorbell. Go to the 2.4, that penetrate well. That's probably a scheme that homes would end up affordably doing, right? Yeah, because I would put the 2.4 router upstairs with all the Internet of Things stuff. And, you know, if that's if that's the network it's on, just an idea. I'm not going to do it, but I'm just kind of thinking through practically, you know, do, I can run one wire up there to the to that router and let it do all those things for now. I think you're right. 
I think eventually everything will go five gigahertz, um, uh, most likely, and we'll switch over. Maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, and then the final point there is sounds good to be on different frequencies, but even to maybe separate bandwidth and so forth. But the bad news is we still haven't addressed that they can all ping each other and hack each other and whatnot. So yeah. I'd rather, again, uh, Steve Gibbs has been talking about that a number of times. Why does an Internet of Things just go on its own network? And he actually is a proponent of you know multiple routers in your home, which gets a little yeah. crazy because each does. is 10, you know, 10 to 15 watts, the new ones. You could be burning 45 watts to run three routers plus your cable modem. Eh, you know, it's something that's left 24-7 running. That gets to be a concern, too. I'd rather... You know, something a little simple. Oh, I always love how you're worried about power. That's oh, my I favorite am. thing. Because here in the Midwest, funny. we're like burning it, you know. We're just like, whatever, yeah. it's fine, you know. But you, I love that you put an emphasis on how much power these things are consuming. Yeah. Oh, my laptop burns three times as much as my new super server. So, yeah, I, I think about that stuff all the time. Because it costs, <laughs> hey, you can't reimburse it to work generally. Right. Your power bill. It's just money yeah. and gone. Yep. It's just gone. Hey, you've got an open VPN page up. Uh, let's. We've been talking about VPNs uh, for the last couple of weeks. We had the guys from Anana Box on two weeks ago, talking about these wireless devices that allow you to create your own VPN through service. Oh, by the way, if you haven't been following them, they just released a new. They just integrated with a new service. I think Viper, right, Mike? Is that have you been yeah. following that Viper? Yep. Viper VPN. Uh, and so, any new devices that are coming out, I'm assuming the old ones will update their their firmware and be able to support those. Um, as well. They have that up and running. So cool. Then uh, last week we had John Nye on and John talked a little bit. We talked some VPN and that. Paul, where do you land on the, for, for you, how are you using VPN and, and um, you know, what's, what's your configuration? Okay. My configuration is a whole lot more complicated than these devices you were talking about. I'm so glad you mentioned them, Jim. So this is two, three years ago. I'll just start out with that. And um, this is what I used when I was uh, living and working in Germany for a month, doing, um, helping write books about technical stuff in the enterprise during the day, and then wanting to be able to do, you know, Netflix or other stuff at night. And with a VPN left rolling at home, I emerged on the Internet as, as if I was home in Connecticut, even though I was far from it. Um, the tricks to the project when I was doing it, well, they didn't have little devices for under 100 bucks. What were the prices on some of what you talked yeah, about? They're 99. 99. 99, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So I would wholeheartedly, you know, recommend that. This is me geeking out on a project three years ago, like, could I do this? And I got it working without a monthly bill. Most VPNs you install on your phone, they want a monthly bill, or on your computer. I got OpenVPN working as an appliance under VMware, where the IP address from my cable modem, a second IP address from my cable modem, was passed through to a Ubuntu OpenVPN appliance. Sounds complicated, but the picture I'm showing here tries to make it a little simpler to explain what I was doing. And it just totally isolated uh, an appliance left running in my home and its own IP, and basically I took up my mobile device or my laptop that was with me far away, or as I travel all over the country, and you go to an IP website to say, where are you? And it thought I was in Connecticut, because that's where I was surfing the web from. It just seamlessly worked for everything, my phone, my computers, you know, I liked it. The catches were, what if your IP address changes when you're at home? And that's dynamic DNS, and that tends to cost money, and you got to log in every few months to keep the accounts active. So those are some of the you know, snafus, um, some issues I had to conquer to try to find a website that would let my IP change and have me not have my phone and my laptop break if I'm on the road when my IP changed. So the devil's as usual in the details, and that's what these articles talk about, um, not just getting an appliance installed, but how do you get a, a, a DNS service that doesn't, you know, crab out on you. Um, but again, these are old articles. I, I, I think a, an appliance is much better. There's even routers that you can leave at home, and of course you guys talk about yeah, um, PFSense, you know, and, PF and all that yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. And so for today's world, I think you know that kind of approach. Um, for most routine travel, I won't necessarily you know use it. I'll use LTE and just stay on that, mm -hmm. stay with modest bandwidth rather than using crummy hotel Wi-Fi. It's almost always crummy, right? So. <laughs> so yeah, thanks Jim for asking. Um, so I yeah. played with OPN, Open VPN, but I plan to revisit it. Um. One last footnote on that. Yeah. Just yesterday, someone left a comment saying, hey, Paul, uh, I've been playing with Amazon Web Services. They spin up a VM there, and they connect to OpenVPN running in the cloud. So they set up their own little personal cloud uh, on Amazon Web Services that they might pay a little money for, depending on how much they use it, and they just connect their laptop and phone to that rather than some machinery left in their home. Completely different approach. Always fun to have someone leave a comment that just turns your head around. It's awesome. Yeah. No, that would work. 
that uh, we we've actually I was was talking with some Microsoft guys, and you can do that through Azure as well. Um, not the most cost-effective way to do it all the time, but it is a way to do it. You know, you know, in a way to get it done. When you get a sec, flip back over to your um, your picture for me, Paul. Sure. Well, good. No, some good stuff there, Mike. I know uh, before we run out of time, you've got a few things uh, you you you'd like to you know just kind of talk through as well. You've um you're you're an Xbox 360. I mean, a uh, Xbox One guy. Oh yeah. And uh, we haven't talked about the One very much. What, what? How are you using that now? Mostly. I'm still loving it. I still suggest to anyone, like if you're gonna buy a new box for your home, and you're okay with spending, you know, the three hundred dollars on it, just go with the Xbox One. It does so much, especially if you have anyone in the home that remotely is interested in playing games, so you can get that feature out of it. But we still use it in our living room as our entire media device. It has Plex on it, so we watch our Plex, Netflix, of course, all of that. But it's about time, finally, HBO Now finally just announced today that they're going on to the Xbox 360 and the One at the same time. So for some reason, they have not been on Xbox this entire time. They've been on all my Apple devices, but we, we moved the Apple TV, so we didn't have the Apple TV in the living room anymore, so we weren't able to use our HBO Now subscription, but now we can on the Xbox. So they seem to just be, I mean, when you talk about one box that's really covering the whole gamut, Xbox is nailing it. They have got every single app, I think, that you could want for entertainment purposes uh, all in one box. Seems to run great. I went, ran into one snafu. It completely bricked on me about a week ago, but uh, through Microsoft support, which actually, okay, I'll, I'll give them some credit. I always say, you know, Apple's the best, and they are at customer service, but this experience wasn't too bad. It was quick. It was online. Walked me through exactly what I needed to do, and uh, we got it up and working. And like, I, I think I mentioned it last week, but thank goodness I had the kangaroo because you needed a Windows PC in order to work do, with Xbox. You? Yeah, so, so I was like, oh, shit. I was like, wait, nope, I do. We're all good. So I was on the Windows, or on the Kangaroo, and got the Xbox up and going. But I'm just glad to see HBO now finally over there. It just made sense. You were like, thank God I podcast on a Windows-based podcast. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, we never say that, but... Um, uh, we talked last week a little bit about, you know, the Pro, the Kangaroo Pro is out, yeah. and I'm hoping to get one here at some point. We haven't seen it quite yet, but... Um, no, very cool. It's it is one of those things too. You know, it is. I man, I go back and forth on the Xbox One. Of is it time? There's some rumors that there's a new box. It'll be it will be branded Xbox One, but it's gonna have some updated hardware in it. Right. That may be coming out here this summer, this fall. So it's like, do you wait? Three fifty is a good price point. Uh, you know, I probably need an Xbox One. Like I need a hole in my head at the moment. It'd just be another box that would sit here for me right. to goof around on, but. Uh, you know, interesting nonetheless. Great media device. I mean, it sounds like you're really getting good use out of it from a media perspective. Oh, yeah. But the one thing I always suggest to people is some people that have it are like, eh, it's decent. Go all out. Do the whole gamut. First of all, get the Connect. And even if you don't plan on using voice commands with your Xbox, get the Connect simply so you can run your cable box if you have a cable box. I know, Jim, you don't, so this wouldn't be an issue for you. But you could also wire something to it, however you do it. But um, if you're going to run your cable box through it, get the Connect so you can have just your Xbox remote do absolutely everything. It turns the volume up on our TV. It controls our box. It does all of that through the Connect because the Connect has the IR beams in it. So that's how it controls everything. So if you're going to do it, I would say get the Connect. It's also nice when you can't find your remote in the couch when it's really dark. And you can say, just say Xbox pause, and it pauses the movie for you. Um, it, so it has some features there. But my buddy, call, you know, Colin, my co-host oh, yeah. on uh, Open Mic Night, X, he X doesn't have, X co-host, I know. <laughs> he, he doesn't have the Connect. And sometimes I'm like, oh, dude, you just, you got to go for it. It's just that much better when you have all of the features enabled on it. Not, not too terribly expensive. No, not at all. And if you don't want to go with the Connect, you can. At first, I had the $5 little IR cables. You can get, the, And it has a port on the back of the Xbox. And you could run those and stick them to the front of your box and your TV. But it makes it a lot easier to have the Connect. Yeah, just get the Connect. So, yeah. so pretty cool. Paul, you had mentioned um, Home Server Show. And uh, we've gotten some comments that we were talking more home automation on, on Dave's show. And then we're talking servers here. Uh, I'd actually, uh, I, I admitted the other day, we've been talking a lot of Drobo here, but I admitted the other day I've taken all my home servers down. Uh, I mean, I, I've, for a time period, I had no servers running here at the in the Collison network, which is a little weird after podcasting about the home server for so long. I finally gave in, um, oh, two weeks ago, on my HPN 40L installed Windows Server, the 2016 tech preview. Um, that is out uh, that you can get through MSDN and and subscribe to. 
Um, and it's running great on that little box. Uh, it only's got four gig of RAM, so virtualization's not awesome on it, just because there's not enough, you know, there's not enough RAM there. But um, you're doing some work. You had this FileZilla, and you've always had some monster stuff in your in your network. Anything new from you in the server area? Yeah, no, absolutely. So here in the chat, someone brought up, "Hey, Paul, what do you think of uh, Intel discontinuing it?" Uh, that's Lopto. There we go. Um, my answer was I hadn't really thought about it since the Intel Xeon D arrived. So Intel surprised everyone. They have something called Rangely or Aviton. You remember those code names too from about a year and a half ago. So Adam Anemic, you don't really seriously think of it for a server. Aviton Rangely, a little better, nice try, low watt burn, but still nowhere near a Core i7 that you could buy for cheaper base or similar. Then finally, Intel's you know sleeper hit of last summer would be the Intel Xeon D1500 series of CPUs. Now things get interesting. For 45 watts, you are now blowing the doors off of all Intel Nooks and uh, dare I say HP something, microservers, even the new one. Their CPUs are still behind. The, the Xeon D is nice. It's a motherboard package with the CPU, which is 800 bucks. So this is not an Intel Nook. This is double the price. But 1600 bucks gets you 64 gig of RAM, two 1 gig interfaces, two 10 gig interfaces. Uh, all in one little compact motherboard that's all 6.7 inches square, but it's not an anemic atom. It's a whole hog, real server that can run a whole lot of workload all the way up to 120 gig of RAM, breaking free of that long standing Core i7 32 uh, gig of memory limit we had. And then finally, um, only 45 watts for everything I just said, which is freaking amazing compared to all any, anything else you'd compare it to, including Core i7 gamer boxes, which would be at least double that. And um, remember I said two 10 gig interfaces? I mean, wow, what the heck would use that? Well, there's an answer. It's NVMe storage, M.2, a little gum stick form factor. Four times faster than any SSD you may have bought, like a Samsung 850, the 950 Pro, that's available only as an M.2. 2,500 megabytes per second reads and 1,500 writes. That is way faster than any other uh, brand of SATA 3 SSD you may be buying. So I was just super excited when Intel came out with that and the one that hit the um, world first was Supermicro who happens to be quite well known for virtualization and the big news there is two months ago partly working my work with Supermicro and these little mini tower super servers that are doing all right in the marketplace we're now in the VMware compatibility list which is a big deal there was never a home server in all my 15 years of using VMware that was actually supported where you can open a ticket and talk to VMware if something goes wrong Kind of a big deal, because suddenly now you could actually use these for small business, not just horsing around in a home lab. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about Intel Xeon D, and Asus and Gigabyte and others are coming out with the same chipset. So that's a good point, a good, good thing. And now they have not just eight core versions with 16 threads of execution. So you run Windows on there, Windows Server 2016, Tech Preview 4 is the last one I use. You probably use 5. Um, Mm, I think so. The, I just pulled yep. it down two weeks ago, so probably. Yeah. yeah, you fire up Task Manager and you see 16 you know, CPUs. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's what you want. A lot of CPU cores and a lot of RAM if you're trying to run a home lab and actually use MSDN products like, well, Hyper-V or VMware or enterprise -y stuff in your home. Finally, I've got horsepower to do it and all using a third of what my three-year-old laptop uses. I've got a laptop with a GPU. It burns like 160 watts when I'm rendering a video for YouTube for my web page. If I do it on the super server, running as a VM, I do the whole workload, even though it might hit 75 watts when it's working hard. And it's a whole lot quicker than a three-year-old laptop. So um, I'm really just happy about that CPU that came out and coupled with NVMe storage, a nice rock solid, you know, a little platform that can hold up to eight storage drives in a tiny little chassis. So yeah, I know I didn't really get that point across as I kind of didn't really listen to my audience uh, when I spoke at Home Server Show and kind of blew that presentation, getting into the weeds about being a dual purpose super server coupled with a Windows 10 workstation. I really should have just focused on this thing runs Linux, it runs FreeNAS, it runs Red Hat versions and SUSE versions of Linux. It runs Nutanix C, that's kind of an enterprise product, it runs VMware, it runs Hyper-V, runs everything I've thrown at it. 2012, an easy install, 2016, super easy install driver support for all of it, no purple screens of death in VMware, no blue screens of death in Windows. It's just been awesome. So, yeah, all, years of looking for something I could just actually recommend to people and just a turnkey solution 
finally came true in the last you know few months. And the second wave just came out last month. And I got my hands on one that's still in the box, waiting for me to do a new unboxing this weekend. Dude, how can it be still sitting in the box? <laughs> uh, I need I need to record it and do it properly, and a few other things like doorbells have gotten in my way. Oh man, you let <laughs> consumer products get ahead I did. of I, enterprise. I mix shop. it up. I try to mix it up. It, it's only a slight speed bump. So what Intel did was came out with a whole another uh, set of um, CPUs. They got a six core model, an eight core, twelve core, sixteen core, all different price points, ranging like five hundred for the motherboard CPU, and everything's attached. A system on a chip means it's a system on a chip. It's a motherboard and CPU soldered right on there. But when you buy that bundle, the, the range is like 500 all the way up to three grand, and you just you know buy what price or capability you need. So uh, wow, that was a long answer to your question, Jim. But that's no, what that's a has answer. a lot of my focus on my site is here. I've got a server that suddenly made it into VMware's compatibility list, and that's just just huge news in my space and my little blog. That's you know largely about people doing virtualization for a career and trying to keep some stuff trained and do stuff at home. Like back up their machines with Veeam or or practical projects like playing with MSDN and getting your certification. All of those need memory and lots of CPU cores. So, a good no, year for hardware. Very for cool. Sure. So, what's the minimum? Like, if I wanted to get in on one of these solutions right now and say, you know, I wanted to get a just a 16, you know, a 16 gig of RAM and and you know a single M2 drive. What am I? Can I can I get in at that kind of price point? I mean, yep, can I buy hardware? You. I'm going to share my desk just briefly, Jim. Yeah. So there's a company uh, called Wired Zone in Florida. I've worked with them and, and visited them. And here's your bundles. If you buy the bundle, um, here, here's the top of the features, right? But tickertry.com forward slash super servers. I'm just going to show you the most common bundle. It's called Bundle 2. There it is. You go to their site. You click on it. And the price today is around 1600 bucks. And what does that come with? Some parts that I actually added. So $1,632 with 64 gig of RAM. It's around 2,000 if you want it with 128 gig of RAM, which is a crazy amount of memory. You could run dozens of VMs at that point. Yeah, for sure. But that's a VM box. I mean, we have to understand you're going to be running lots of VMs on this thing. Correct. There's another bundle called Bundle 1 that just adds a GPU in the PCI slot, and that would be more of a Windows 10 box. Um, so, yeah, what, what some of the extras thrown in are like a USB key to throw ESXi on, assistant speakers so you can hear it beep when the BIOS is done booting. An extra SATA cable, so all you, all six of your SATA base can be used without having to go buy a cable and spend shipping on it. And some ticker try stickers, assembly, and burn and testing. So the nice thing is when they ship this, like in Europe to someone far away, the other side of Europe, or from Florida to wherever in the country, it's been burn and test for four hours. That reduces returns. People are happy. They just turn it on, put VMware there in 10 minutes. They can play on a Saturday, not getting the thing working. Just Install and run. The only thing you bring to the party, it is a kit like an Intel Nook. You need to bring your own storage. So put your own hard drives in there or buy some when you're when you're buying the unit. Um, Lopta says, hey, wait, is that the free NAS Mini? It is. Lopta, perfect. So the free NAS, they've got their own logoing program. I'm actually uh, talking to Supermicro a little bit about this tomorrow. But <laughs> it's a very familiar looking server. It's proliferating a bit and other companies are leveraging it. So here's FreeNAS. That is a familiar looking cover there. And they got their own FreeNAS sticker on the front. So thank you, Lopton. Here's a picture that's they put their own spin, they have their own hard drive covers that look kind of cool. Everything else is just super stock super micro that you're looking at in the picture. What are their what are their retail for this? Uh, let's have a look. They have an eight bay. So the normal one is you know four bays in the front two uh, internal 2.5-inch base for SSDs, and then two PCI base storage. That totals eight. Here's one that is eight 3.5-inch base, so double the height. And let's see if I can get the pricing for you. Uh, here we Pay go. Pay attention there, Uyghur. Yeah, bay, I'm really bucks. closely, actually. So here's an empty free NAS, pretty pricey. So for me, I'd rather spend 1600 and have a machine I can run full virtualization on and, and just put your storage and go. But if you are really into free NAS, you can go with four bay for a thousand. Let's see what happens. Does it let me configure and buy it from them with drives? I don't know. Or is it going to ship me off to Amazon? Uh, here we go. Let's try it. Anyhow, eight bay, fifteen hundred, four bay, a thousand, and that's sixteen gig of RAM. So that's one fourth the RAM in my sixteen hundred dollar bundle. So yeah, it just this is meant to be a really amazing storage subsystem, and that's all yeah. it is. And You're for for just a NAS, you could probably get it. Sixteen would be plenty. Correct, and I think, cases, right? and that's a little bit of a lesser motherboard. They went with a little lesser CPU that doesn't have a 10 gig. 
if you beef up the price and go for the other one, I think that gives you the 10 gig interfaces, which, you know, if you're talking, well, I, I'm not really that into spinning drives, frankly, anymore. SSDs have gotten cheap enough where I tend to go with them, but let's see what happens. If you go with the 8 bay, I think that might give you the 10 gig interfaces. And when, you have, when you have $200 one, one terabyte um, SSDs, <laughs> it's a little tough to think about spinners. Yeah, and again, NVMe is a little more expensive for the gumstick profile, but wow, if you break open a, a 2.5-inch laptop-style SSD these days, all that's in there is a tiny chip. They're, we're headed towards dump in the SATE interface, mm -hmm. and NVMe has done a fantastic job there. And uh, here, if we, uh, I'm going to go to Google and just say that boot from NVMe has been a little dodgy in the early days, late last year, as people started getting their Skylake processors. Um, and on server systems, they tend to make things easier. And there's my article, How to Boot from NVMe. Let me go to the world view. So Intel has an article on how to do it. There's my article, and this kind of gives you the rundown and some stuff I had to optionally tweak in my motherboard. You can pretty much just buy it and shove one of these in, and Windows will install. But this article kind of goes over some stuff to... Uh, look out for. Um, uh, uh, Paul, what's IPMI? Sure, IPMI, um, ILO for HP, everyone who loves the out-of-band management. IPMI is a more generic acronym where the industry, HP, Intel, Lenovo, and others, they use IPMI in the motherboard. That's the feature they're leveraging. So HP calls it ILO. Um, Supermicro calls it IKVM, where you point your browser to the server and you do stuff to it. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm showing that on the screen here. So I pointed my browser to the management IP of my server, a fifth Ethernet port dedicated to management. It doesn't take up my other ports that I use for other stuff. And that's how I can control and see what my machine is doing. So that's what IPMI is. Um, unfortunately, today it's still a Java app, but it will be HTML5 in the future, which is another cool thing. The same server will do HTML5. So you can avoid Java vulnerabilities in that junk. And there you so go. I'm, Here's VMware running on my server in my basement right now. That's a live view of it. Um, so I've learned I need to get a house and I need to move up my start date of my job so I can start buying cool stuff like this. <laughs> Two things I needed to work on right now. <laughs> yeah, I know for sure. For yeah. sure. Some some cool stuff there. For, yeah, that's – that's. Um, I, I always love having Paul on because he's – so detailed, all this stuff. We just watch. He just, we just watch the magic. If you're listening to the audio version of this, if we haven't gotten booted off YouTube for playing tequila, then uh, <laughs> you want to head over to the YouTube video to have a have a peek at that. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, and you, and you asked me to talk a lot tonight, so I, I guess I did. No, um, it's great. No, it's perfect. The, That's the what 950... we brought you on for. That's why we bring on guests. <laughs> I think a much broader audience that doesn't have a server would be Skylake. They probably have M2 on their motherboard if they bought it with a little bit of gaming. And that's where I'll just point out to this article. If you want to know, you know, get yourself M2. Is it worth it? If you have a PCI 3 motherboard, it's the spec you're looking for. That's times four lanes. So PCI 3 X4 is what you look for in your motherboard spec. If you got that, it means you probably bought it in 2006. And that means you will get the benchmarks that I'm about to show you here. That's what your ATTO disk bench should look like. Those are incredible numbers. They actually exceed the specifications that Samsung states. So this, you know, little server is not an atom. I want to point that out over and over again. It is as fast um, as, you know, it, well, it's more coarse, more server focused. It's getting more work done with less coarse. It has more cache than Skylake. It's more server friendly. That's why it's a Xeon. But unlike the old Xeon days, a 32 gig stick of memory is down to 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. So you can fully complement it with 628 gig for with 800. That's where the $2,000 price point comes in. System 1200, 800 for RAM, 2,000 bucks. That is a long way from two years ago where you couldn't even do this. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It just just the the price points keep coming down and uh, and uh, there's just some great hardware out there. I mean that's it is one of those deals. You're just you're highlighting it right here. All right. Well, let me, uh, Paul. Thanks for for all that. That's awesome. That's um, you know, we, we do a lot of that here. And so, if you're new to the show, we get that uh, that. And if you, you head over to Home Server Show as well, we we, we talk about those uh, those products over there as well. Um, as we wrap it, Paul, stay around for a second. Do me a favor. Flip back over to your uh, to your camera for me, if you would. Um, while we wrap it, we have been. I've kind of committed to these Amazon. Um, I'll say Alexa down here segments because the other word is what triggers my uh, hair. And so uh, what I'm hoping to do over the next uh, couple months as we get new updates to it, 
uh, will highlight things that are coming on from the from the Amazon Alexa device. Um, and this week, of course, there were two things. We highlighted uh, Cinco de Mayo this week, and so we heard tequila when we started the show. But it was um, uh, May the 4th, right? May the 4th be with you. And so, of course, there were some cool things that they did uh, on the Echo. And so if you say Echo, Echo, tell me a Star Wars joke. Who is the most Earth-friendly Star Wars character? Princess Leia Organic. <laughs> yeah, there you go. A little joke for you. Not the funniest of ones. Let's try it again. Echo, tell it's me a, a Star Wars joke. What do you call a statue in the Star Wars gift shop? Mannequin Skywalker. Ah, that's a pretty good one. Mannequin Skywalker, that's pretty good. We'll do one more. Echo, tell me a Star Wars joke. Why shouldn't you ask Yoda for money? Because he's always a little short. There you go. So, some cool things going on. Uh, the, other th the other interesting ones were the Star Wars facts. So, Echo, tell me a Star Wars fact. Ewan McGregor is the nephew of Dennis Lawson who played Wedge Antilles in the original movies. Uh, Echo, tell me a Star Wars fact. The Starship Enterprise can briefly be seen flying around Coruscant in The Phantom Menace. Ooh, I did <laughs> not know that one. That's, that's a little geekery for, your, for the Star Wars fans. Uh, this one also came as well. Echo, may the fourth be with you. Happy Star Wars Day. Time to party like an Ewok. Yes, time to party like an Ewok. One of the things, um, of course, the Echo gets into is these new skills, which is basically that um, where vendors can come in and extend out the the functionality of the of the uh, of the device. And uh, recently, the one that was highlighted, which is Mother's Day this weekend, by the way, guys, it's Mother's Day this weekend. You should call your mothers. And uh, one eight hundred flowers is actually a skill that's available, and so you can easily. We've always known these devices would be turned into selling machines, right? That's kind of what they're. We know that's what they're going to be. But now, if you enable the one eight hundred flowers skill, uh, there are four different arrangements that you can purchase right off the right off of your Echo, and it will. Um, oh, it's not hearing me very well. Good, and uh, it, they'll have them shipped directly to you. Uh, one of the last things we'll, we'll highlight, and this is actually my favorite, is uh, we play tons of music through the Echo, and so you can say Echo, Echo, play top pop music station. Getting top pop station from Prime Music. <coughs> now, if you like, if you like top pop music, you can do that. But it'll play absolutely anything. One of my favorites are, are of course, I'm a big Genesis fan, and so. Uh, I, I always tell it to play Genesis or Phil Collins, pops right in and plays all those for me. So very, very handy to have, and it's just a music machine. It's one of the coolest things that uh, that I've got. We'll highlight one of those Echo. If you've got an Echo um, or if you have an Alexa or an Echo um, task that you'd like me to cover or you'd like to do on the show, just let me know. Send me an email, jim at theaverageguy.tv, and we'll cover that right here as we talk about... Because I think this is really, Mike, I think this is really going to blow up in the next couple of years. I mean, I think this is one of those things that's just going to keep getting better. Have you you found any new uses in your in your uh, Alexa, Amazon Echo? I, I don't explore too much into the new uses, but because it, it's just so good at doing what it already does. You know, timers, music, I, can't, I still can't get over the yeah. speaker on that thing. Uh, it's just fantastic. So, no, no, I haven't explored anything new. I just keep using it for... I use it probably 20 to 30 times a day. I'm probably speaking to it, and more so if we're cooking for timers. So, Yeah, so and the other thing, uh, Lopta has forever been trying to get me to play this particular song. Way back in the day, like we, we used to play music before the show. This was years ago. I remember. A couple years ago, yeah. And it, this, this three dead trolls in a baggie, right? So let's see if it's actually on there. Echo, play three dead trolls in a baggie from Prime Music. I couldn't oh, find any it's album in a baggie. Three Dead Trolls in a Baggie and Prime Music. No, I did say that. So, yeah. no, Lopta didn't work. She can't find it. So I, that's uh, that music, that song will never be played. Through, I shouldn't say never. It will not be played through the Echo. Well, we, uh, we're at the end of this. We're going to stay around for a little bit of post-show. So if you're listening live, hang tight. We'll be back around. I'll remind everyone that uh, we want to thank you for all that you do uh, for the network. It's always awesome to have you guys as part of the listeners. If you have, if you want to submit, like I mentioned, if you want to submit anything into us, stuff you want me to cover, um, we've got a few open spots for the rest of the year for guests. And so uh, if you want to 
suggest a few or help me broker a few. We need to get the guys from Kangaroo back on, Mike. That's yes. little, we need to reach out to them and get that scheduled. But if you've got a suggestion, don't just send it to me. Uh, help me broker it. Uh, send them an email. Say, hey, I listen to this great podcast, and it would be awesome if uh, you'd go on their show. That means a lot more than me contacting them, by the way, when they have an actual user, contact them. So let me know, Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv, and help me get them on. Of course, the TheAverageGuy.tv platform, both web and media hosting, powered by Maple Grove Partners, and uh, get secure, reliable, high-speed hosting from people you know and trust. And speaking of that, Christian's coming back on Cyber Frontiers next Monday. Boom. So by the time you're, yeah, we'll be every every three weeks or so through the summer, so we're pretty excited about it. Get him back on the air. School is out, and we're excited to have Christian back starting uh, May 9th. Of course, we'll thank Roger over at WLMN Radio, who continues to stream Home Gadget Geeks uh, from Grafton, West Virginia. And, Roger, thanks for all you do. If you are listening from Grafton, send me an email. Love to uh, know if you're listening out there and what you like best about the show. Don't forget you can catch us on our new app that's out there as well, sponsored by LastPass. Uh, again, just go to Home gadgetgeeks.com, download that, and you can pretty much, it's a streaming machine. So if you want to stream uh, from your phone, uh, you can do it over Wi-Fi if you don't want to use your data plan. If you want to stream our shows on iPhone, you can download them on Android, I think. I think that app allows for down, downloads. Now, you can uh, use our app. It's a great way to do it. I get nine or ten of you that listen to the show every I think last week we set a record with 12, Mike. I remember you saying that during the show. That's awesome. Weird. So uh, it's great, but uh, if you're listening on Android or if you're listening on Spreaker, appreciate that as well. Don't forget to use the Average Guy Tech Scholarship Fund link at theaverageguy.tv slash Amazon. For those folks in Canada, you can use theaverageguy.tv slash Amazon CA. We appreciate that. That goes into the fund. We purchase things with it, send them out to folks. They can write about it or come on the show and talk about it. And a great way to get honest and open reviews on things we've purchased without having to go through the vendors. Because, you know, when you get it from a vendor, Mike, you're, you feel a little beholden to them, you know? Yeah, yeah definitely you do. Try, you try not to, but you kind of do. Yeah. So, Paul, you just got – so Supermicro shipped you that that new server, right? No. Um, no, no, my whole did. site is – yeah. Did you um, fund that? I did a, I did have a 60-day loaner at one point okay. before when it was beta, and uh, they were kind enough to mail it to me, and I showed it off at three local user groups. So I've actually presented several times. And I'm actually flying to Las Vegas with my own hardware at the end of the month and delivering one of them to uh, another guy who bought the most decked out one for worth like three grand. He's put all the most expensive storage in there and stuffed it to the gills. Nice. So, um, but yeah, no, this is my own stuff. Pretty much everything okay. on my site is stuff that I keep and bought and so forth. Yeah. And if it doesn't work out, I return it. Um, yeah. Or in, or you say bad things about it, right? I mean, that's no. The, I mean, well, well, I'll be honest. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if I'm yeah. trying to keep other people from my pain, but most of the right. time, the articles that'll make it are the things that worked out. Okay. So, known good solutions for me in my house. Good to know. Nice. Yeah. But I, I would say, oftentimes, if you buy something and it doesn't work, let us know so we don't buy it and make right. the same mistake. Yeah, right. I just don't find point. an article fun if it's totally negative. No, to totally, no you're right on. Right on. Yeah, it's it's like if it had some redeeming qualities, whatever, sure. But yeah. I've got so many articles in the hopper that um, right. it, it's hard. But yeah, yeah. That, it, you're right. It, it can be an issue. So I, I tend to shop very carefully. I tend to mm -hmm. over shop and overthink. And finally, when I pull the trigger, I, I test the heck out of it. And if I don't get a good feeling after a week or two, back it goes. Yeah, um, no, it's all good. That's the way it should be. That is the way it should be. Well, we are out here every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out at theaverageguy.tv slash live. A couple shows coming up uh, that we can highlight. I actually only have two in the hopper at this point. I need to get some more scheduled. But next week, Shauna Dorsey, she is the, the director of the Interface School. We're going to talk a little code and a little code education. We've never talked about code on the show in this way. Mike has the week off, so I invited Shauna to come in. Uh, she's local here from Omaha, her first podcast appearance. Actually, she's becoming quite a big deal. She just got accepted this big award for teaching children code in Las Vegas. And so she's coming on. She's a good friend of mine, and uh, she'll be on next week to talk about code and education, getting our kids writing code. They can write code a lot easier, a lot earlier than we think these days, and we have me doing web development very early in, in their education. And so Sean is going to talk about that. We uh, talked a little bit about this before, but Emily and James from Classy Little Podcast is coming on. By the way, if you if you listen to Classy Little Podcast, it's not safe for work. Now, it's not filthy. It's not it's not that kind, but a few swear words in there from time to time. Uh, but they are funny. Uh, Mike, you listened to them this week. I, I did too. Them. I laughed quite a bit. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. 
They're one of they're, those because I, like I said, I go on this cycle of what kind of podcasts I listen to, and I'm back into the non-tech cycle right now a little bit, and uh, and they're up there. Well, it's a wine. It's a wine. They drink wine and talk about. It. And it's cheers to something. That's kind of right. their motif. And so we're going to do cheers to gadgets, and we're going to talk about their gadgets and what they use and how they podcast and. We're just gonna have a good time. I we might even need to get a bottle of wine, Mike. Yes, that's uh, my maybe, favorite. Maybe, I didn't want to admit it, but that's my favorite. <laughs> maybe you and I will coordinate uh, on a baker's bottle of wine somehow. And, a nice uh, cab, you know, something like that. Well, I don't share a bottle of wine, Jim. I mean, <laughs> I don't. I don't share that. <laughs> well, no, you would have yours. Let's be clear. You oh, would have okay. yours. Okay. I would have mine. Yeah. 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 A bottle and, of uh, serving, think, you know. I think James and Emily <laughs> will be coming in, but it'll be a fun comedy. We're going to try and make it fun and just lighthearted and have to have a good time. They're a great, uh, and if you're just looking for uh, kind of a, a comedy podcast that I think is done very, very well, Emily and James do just a great job, and I've enjoyed listening to that. It's called Classy Little. It's anything but classy. Sometimes, Classy Little. <laughs> Podcast is the name of the podcast, and they'll be on here in two weeks. And then it kind of opens up. So if you've got some suggestions that you want us to do, sure, I'll let you know. 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, now at the Average Guy TV Live. We are way over time. Thanks for listening. Stay around for the post show. Good night, everybody. <laughs>